I said this is AWC in Conversation. My name is Joey Clark. I'm a science communicator with Australian Wildlife Conservancy, and I'm speaking to you from Sydney. The traditional owners of this area are Gadigal people, and that's part of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders and to the traditional owners. Today, I'm joined by a special guest and a familiar face to some of you. Felicity Lotelier is the senior field ecologist at Mount Zero Taravale Wildlife Sanctuary but worked for over a decade at Scotia Wildlife Sanctuary in Western New South Wales. And some of you may have met her there. Flick, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Joey. Good to see you. And you're up there with um, a, a two-man two team uh, running the show at Mount Zero. So you've got Macadero. Oh, Hello. Hello. Now that face with a, an ISO beard going there, Macca. <laughs> So yeah, it's um, so good day to everyone that we've met before um, across the properties, particularly down at Scotia, and a, a special shout out to all those Victorians viewing um, to thinking of everyone down there. Mm, hopefully this is a, a bit of an escape for people. So, um, you know, from lockdown into tropical North Queensland, it's a, a pretty good option, I think. And you've got some rain up there today? Yeah, so I don't know if you guys can see, it's actually our first rain in two months. Um, timed in well for this. So hopefully you can't hear that coming through the audio uh, too much. We've had about 10 mil overnight, but we're up to about 1200 mil for the year. Uh, so nice and green up here. Mm. Now we're going to be talking about a really important project to reintroduce the Northern Betong. <laughs> Thanks, Macca. <laughs> um, to reintroduce the Northern Betong back to the sanctuary there, and we'll come to that in a minute. But Flick, I'm interested in uh, your career up to this point, because you've had a, a diverse career working in lots of different landscapes. And the research project you did early on for honours was actually on owls. Can you tell us a little bit about that work? Yeah, that's right. So my honours studies, um, so that was down in Far East in Victoria, East Gippsland, which is where I grew up um, in and around Orbost and Marlow down there. So I studied two species of, of owl, the mast owl, which is what you've got up on the screen there, uh, and the sooty owl. So um, with the help of um, another um, bloke doing his PhD on a similar topic, Rowan Bilney. Uh, we were catching those owls, beautiful birds, uh, attaching little uh, radio telemetry backpacks to them, uh, setting them free and tracking their movements through the landscape. Uh, so yeah, wonderful uh, year to spend out in the bush, quite a formative year too, and really inspired me to go on with that kind of work. What amazing birds to, to be able to actually handle those, you know, big nocturnal birds of prey. Um, did you always want to work with wildlife? Was that a passion for you as a kid? Yeah, I think so. So, um, you know, I grew up in that era of having Captain Planet and uh, Ranger Stacy on the on the telly. Um, so from a very young age, I um, was really keen to work with animals and in conservation um, and really have, a, you know, I guess, a, a meaningful contribution to that. Mm. Um, and did the owl work lead on to other projects or was that kind of a standalone one year honours? Uh, so that was the extent of my um, academic research. I guess I always had plans to go on and do further study. Um, and in the interim, I just started to have a break and do a few short contracts. Uh, during that time, I, I did a few contracts with Parks Victoria, you know, ACT Parks, um, and met someone that most of you will have come across in your time with AWC, Joe Stevens. He told me about this job coming up with um, a, a group called AWC and that I should really apply because it was a really wonderful organisation. So I did. Uh, that was a nine month contract um, and almost 12 years later, um, here I am still. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and we're so lucky to have you. That first position was at Scotia and that's a big change of scene for someone from Gippsland. Um, so this is out in the Mallee country in uh, Western New South Wales, far Western New South Wales. What was your work at Scotia? What did that involve? Yeah, so initially I was employed on our operations team out there. Um, so a lot of feral animal control, fence maintenance. Many of you will know that up until recent years, Scotia Sanctuary held the, um, the title of largest area on mainland Australia that was feral free. So since that time, New Haven um, superseded it. And just last week, I think it was Nelly Cliffs uh, now holds that title. So shout out to all the crew down there. Um, so up. yeah, moving out to... Yeah, we keep breaking Sorry. our own records with... Uh, <laughs> <That's area. right. laughs> so, yeah, Mallee Cliffs is now the biggest on mainland Australia, but the, the other two are also AWC sites. Um, sorry, Flick, so your, your work at Scotia. 
Yeah, so a, a lot of the ecology work and I guess our operations work as well is um, really focused around that uh, feral predator free exclusion, exposure um, that we've established and the reintroduced mammal populations um, that, that call the area home. So a lot of monitoring, um, it's not enough for us to just erect these fences and um, reintroduce populations. We need to do the ongoing uh, monitoring, the ongoing science and make sure that um, they're all healthy and thriving and um, that we're doing our job. Now at Scotia, you actually lived inside that feral predator free exclosure. That's where the staff quarters are. What's it like living among so many threatened animals? I think you tend to get a little bit complacent about it. So when you've got bilbies in the chook pen um, and bridled now tell wallabies, you know, banging at your back door. Um, yeah, it's, it's really easy to think, you know, this is, this is normal. This is, um, you know, everyday life. But in reality, um, what we were seeing was the landscape as it was supposed to be 200 years ago, but outside of those exposure fences, we've got, got cats, foxes, etc. in the landscape. Um, and a lot of those small mammals, uh, most people don't actually have the opportunity to, to witness them anymore. Mm, what a privilege. Bilby's in the chook pen. That's, that's <laughs> Um So that was, uh, you had several different roles at Scotia, but um, leading up to a, a full-time ecologist role. Um, and you also travelled around, and we've just had someone in the chat say, what about the long-haired rats at Kalamurna? Because you did surveys at other sectors <laughs> over that time. What, what's the story yeah, there? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, as part of the South East team, uh, ecology team, you know, did a lot of work across our arid, arid and semi-arid uh, properties. So the long-haired rat, I think I actually heard Chantelle Jackson um, comment about them too during your, your webinar with her. They're a native species of rat that boom, um, absolutely boom during the, the wet years. So exploding populations down through Central Australia, that was out at Palamurna. Um, I think every pitfall trap that you come to, there was a, a rat <laughs> uh, when we were doing our monitoring. Um, but you know, the, the beautiful thing about that is that the uh, letter wing kites follow the long haired rats. Um, so yeah, that's, ah, cool. that's where the long haired rats come in. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of work in the arid zone, it sounds like. Um, and then after almost 11 years at Scotia, you've now moved um, to a completely different landscape at Mount Zero Taravale. I'll just share the map so that people can see um, where that is. So it's, it's basically inland from Townsville and up the range. Um, and it sits at a, a, a kind of junction between different ecosystems. What has that change in landscape been like for you to experience? Yeah, pretty incredible. A, a really massive, um, you know, learning curve, I guess. Uh, we went from a landscape where the average rainfall was 200 and 30, 240 mil of rain a year to here at Mount Zero, um, the north of the property receives over two metres of, of rainfall a year. So incredible diversity uh, within the, the property itself. As I said, over two metres of rain in the north down to less than half a metre of rain in the south. Um, altitude gradient as well. So uh, Mount Zero uh, sits at just over a thousand metres above sea level down to the Star Valley, which you're seeing there. Uh, that's at about uh, 300 metres above sea level. Um, across that gradient too, we see a, a, a massive diversity of uh, vegetation and, and fauna. Mm. So yeah, lot, lots of learning to be done. Yeah, um, those really interesting gradients across altitude and rainfall mean that it's very diverse. So, you know, I think it's what, just under 60,000 hectares. So mm -hmm. relatively small for AWC uh, sanctuaries but the diversity there is incredible. Lots of different plants, um, lots of threatened species. Um, and I might just share some photos of the, some of the landscapes at Mount Zero Taravel, because there's, there's quite a mix, aren't there? Yeah, so I think there were 63 um, different uh, vegetation types um, mapped on the property. Uh, so broadly grouped into 19 different habitat types. We've got over a, a thousand plants on our, our species list over 240 birds, um, over 90 reptiles, uh, nine different, nine or 10 different uh, macropods, eight different possums. Uh, so yeah, in, incredible diversity, something for everyone out here, certainly. Now, one of the threatened species hangs out in the rocky gorges. So a lot of the property is dominated by granite geology um, and these quite dramatic uh, twisting and turning gorges. Um, and there's a really special rock wallaby there. Can you tell us about that species? 
Yep, so that's the Shaman's Rock Wallaby. So our own um, Dr. Catherine Hayes, she's a, one of our wildlife ecologists based up in Cairns. She did her PhD out here at Mount Zero um, studying the Shaman's Rock Wallaby. So we protect about 70% of the known uh, colonies of this species here um, at Mount Zero. So, uh, you know, really critical um, habitat for them. Mm. Yeah, and as always, our, our research program is targeted to look into the ecology of threatened species um, so that we can improve, you know, how we're looking after them on the property. So really interesting outputs from, from that work on them. It's not what we're talking about today, but it might be <laughs> subject of a, another webinar at some point. Um, one of the really important vegetation communities on Mount Zero is, well, we call it wet sclerophyll or, or tall sclerophyll forest. Um, so that's a bit of a weird word, sclerophyll. What does that mean and what's that community? Yeah, so the sclerophyll forest, I guess, refers to um, those forests that are dominated by an, a eucalypt um, canopy or overstory. So here at Mount Zero Taraval, we've got um, wet sclerophyll uh, throughout the, the north of the, the property. So very, very tall um, wet sclerophyll, some of those uh, uh, flooded gums that you're seeing there, um, you know, in excess of 50 metres tall. Um, and that grassy understory that you see there, that's a really critical habitat for the northern betong, uh, which is what we're talking about today. Um, so the, the wet sclerophyll is quite dependent on fire uh, to be maintained as um, that open wet sclerophyll forest. In the absence of fire, uh, we see a, a succession into rainforest. Mm. Um, so uh, I guess under the, the, the previous management of Mount Zero Taraval prior to AWC, um, it was ab about pastoral management um, during European days. And so fire was largely excluded. And we've seen a lot of that wet sclerophyll forest now invaded or captured um, by, by rainforest and woody thickening. Um, and due to that, the country becomes less suitable for a lot of those specialist species that once occurred there. Mm. It's a, a very interesting situation. So this is a, a community that kind of fringes the rainforests in the wet tropics. Um, so it's it's kind of a transition ecosystem, I guess. Um, and as you say, it's naturally, well, it, it's got an open understory, but that's been maintained by, I guess, indigenous fire management over mm -hmm. centuries, millennia. And it's actually the absence of that fire management, as you're saying, that uh, has led to a degradation in the structure of the habitat. So whereas normally we think of rainforest as precious and something that needs to be saved, in this case, rainforest plants are actually invading that tall open forest in the understory. And that means it's much harder to get fire in there. So we're losing the grassy layer and we're also losing that open structure. So for some species, it means it's completely changing the, the habitat and it makes it um, impossible for them to, to persist in that habitat. So what have we done to try and you know, fix that and try and restore that open structure? What have been the different techniques? Yeah, I guess so right across the property, there's a few, um, you know, a number of different land management um, uh, techniques that we're implementing. So we're, we're removing firstly, you know, cattle, we've de-stocked cattle from the property. Uh, we're controlling other ferals like feral pigs, but particularly up in that wet sclerophyll, we're trying to open up that understory. So um, because fire has been excluded for so long, it is hard to initially get fire back in. So it might be that we need to go in um, and mechanically remove. Um, so yeah, the shots that you're seeing there, um, the team have been in with chainsaws and actually cut down some of that alocasurina. Uh, we've also trialled um, the use of small bulldozers, um, use of chemicals. So trying to, to thin out that understory so that we can push fire back in. Um, and once we get that grassy understory re-established, uh, it's much easier to replicate, um, you know, those traditional burning practices across the landscape. Like, um, I think people might be shocked to hear that we're using, you know, heavy machinery to, to open up the understory, because that sounds quite drastic. But, um, you know, we're talking about it, it's basically a bobcat, isn't it? Like a, a small, um, small machine yeah. that can go in and quite <laughs> so delicately remove some of that undergrowth. Yeah, for sure. So it's just about, uh, about getting some, um, you know, it's mechanical disturbance um, just to try and open up that understory uh, in, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a long process of returning the landscape to, to what it traditionally was. So there's, there's been a number of different plots where we've tried some of these different methods and 
you know, as you say, in the short term, it can be um, some of those mechanical uh, methods. But after that, we try and maintain that structure using fire. And we've talked a lot about fire management in different places, but this is quite a specific situation where, you know, we're trying to establish cool, regular burns to maintain that grassy understory. So it's quite a, a specific objective in that veg community. Um, has that been effective in these parts of Mount Zero Taravel? Yeah, definitely. It's been really successful. Um, so across these um, trial sites, uh, we're getting that grass back, we're getting fire in, um, and through that, you know, returning that regular uh, fire regime to the landscape, the effects at those trial sites will slowly expand. Mm. So, yeah. And at the same time, as with all of our sanctuaries, monitoring wildlife to see the response. So there's, uh, you know, a comprehensive ecological health survey, which is carried out at regular intervals. Um, and we expect to see a, a response in some of the, the small mammals and reptiles and things to yeah. that, um, that management as well. Um, yeah. I might just remind everyone that you can use the Q&A button to ask questions. Um, and we've already had a bunch of questions. So at the end, we'll try and address mm -hmm. Um, as many of those as we can. Um, yeah, okay. Well, this is, it's really interesting, Flick. So that's, we've kind of talked about the work that's been done to restore the habitat and um, improve the structure or get back to that, that structure of an open understory with a tall canopy. Um, but I'm really keen to get onto the species that we're talking about today, the Northern Betong. Can you introduce us to the Northern Betong? What is a Betong? Some people might not have heard of a Betong before. Oh, yeah, betong, it's a, a small uh, nocturnal macropod. Uh, so they were you know, referred, to rat, re referred to as rat kangaroos. Probably doesn't have the nicest connotations. Um, but the, so the, the northern betong, its average size is about 1.2 kilograms. So quite a small uh, little critter. Um, these guys once occurred from the Carbine Tablelands up north of Cairns down to the Cohen Range down here at Mount Zero Taravel. There was also, I think, one record as far south as uh, Rockhampton in the, the late 1800s. But um, once upon a time, can, might have been considered a, a subspecies of Bet Betongia penicillata, which is the, the woily, which many of you might be familiar with. Uh, but they're now considered um, a species of their own right. Uh, so they're now only known from two populations um, in the wet tropics of North Queensland, uh, in that wet sclerophyll forest that you were talking about. Uh, so in the last 10 to 20 years, two of the last four known populations um, appear to have gone extinct. So uh, it's estimated that there's only around a thousand individuals of this species left. And they're one of the, the 20 mammal species um, considered at, at most risk of, of extinction. Um, so quite a, a special little critter. Um, they're a, a mycorrhizal fungi specialist, uh, so they really like truffles. Um, that's their, their key food, uh, so very expensive taste. And I guess during um, wetter years or through the, uh, sorry, dr dry years or the drier extent of their range, they'll also um, be dependent on a number, number of other food species. So um, cockatoo grass tubers, um, tubers of lilies, uh, other grass. You know, mm. So the, those grass, stems. the grass tubers, as you're saying, they're an important part of the diet, but as that grass has been kind of smothered by the, the changing composition of the vegetation, I guess it's removing or, or impacting one of their main food sources. So that's another reason why yeah. restoring the grassy understory is important. Um, and you said that they eat truffles or uh, those subterranean fungi. Um, do we know if that's important in how the ecosystem works? Do they contribute in some way to, to moving those fungi around? Yeah, so they have a, an important role to play in, um, you know, distribution of fungi and the fungi have a, a role to play in broader ecosystem health. So um, in that sense, the northern betongs really are important to overall uh, ecosystem health. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting how everything is connected. So, you know, restoring a species like this isn't just about the animal and we've said this before it's about all of the services that they provide all of the interactions um, with with the greater ecosystem so um, fascinating little animals as you said there were four populations known in recent times um, mm -hmm. but two of those have blinked out um, basically in front of our eyes while we've been watching so uh, only two populations remain 
And you've actually been doing some work with the Northeast team up there, looking at some of those remaining populations. What's that, uh, what has that told you about the species? Yeah, so um, we've been undertaking a, a project up at Mount Lewis National Park, Mount Sturgeon, uh, for the last few years in partnership with uh, Queensland Parks and with the traditional owner group, Western Yalangi. Uh, and so we've been doing some cage trapping up there to look at, uh, you know, try and get a population estimate because it's not really clear how many individuals are still persisting within that population. We think it might be around about 100 individuals, but uh, we you know, want to do a, a lot more work and really get a, a, a good grip on what's going on. That animal that you're seeing there is fitted with a, a little GPS tracker as well. So we're catching them, attaching a, a subset, uh, attaching collars to a subset of individuals and learning more about you know, their, their movements throughout the landscape. Um, uh, also a, a really important part of that particular project at Mount Lewis is looking at the impacts of cattle um, on Northern Betong. So parks are uh, establishing a, a cattle fence uh, to exclude cattle from that location. So through our research, we'll be um, looking at how the removal of cattle then impacts vegetation and feral predators. And at the end of the day, the, the benefit to Northern Betongs in the, the lamb range. So we're, we're gonna be working across three different subpopulations of Northern Betongs there. Uh, and working with traditional owner groups, uh, Jabagai, Buluai, and Wajimbara Tableland Yugimji. Um, and so uh, again, trying to replicate some of that work, uh, cage trapping to look at population estimates, but also using camera traps and seeing if we can correlate um, uh, our outputs from cage trapping against camera trapping and see if camera trapping might be a, a reliable way of uh, generating robust estimates for these guys into the future. Mm. And that's something um, that we can then pass on to uh, traditional owner groups there and hopefully, you know, um, into the future they can take on that that monitoring effort which will be really wonderful that's fantastic it's a really collaborative project and that's an important part of how awc operates you know we we recognize that we need partners we need people to help us out with a lot of these projects um and and you've seen that in in a lot of our recent work um now we've got a bunch of questions coming in and we'll come to some of those in a moment uh, Flick, was the Northern Betong ever found at Mount Zero Tara Vale? And what, what are the last records for that? Yeah, so I think the, um, they were recorded here in 1997, uh, but the last record was around 2003. So it might have been that by the time that they were, they were found to be here, they were already um, you know, on the edge of blinking, um, blinking out. Uh, but there's a, a few um, suggestions as to why that might be, why they're no longer found um, in this area. So uh, there were some pretty significant drought conditions at that time, coupled with uh, former pastoral management. So um, cattle in the landscape, uh, pigs uh, leading to habitat degradation, the exclusion of fire. So like we were talking about before, uh, habitat um, changing and, and no longer being suitable. Uh, and then, you know, the, the age-old predation um, by feral predators. So uh, up here, uh, a, key, a key threat is cats. So mm. all of those critical weight range species. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So just to, I'm just thinking through those threats you talked about, feral herbivores, including cattle, um, feral predators, of course, the structure of the habitat changing. Can we do something about each of those threats? Why, yes, we can, Joey. <laughs> um, so already across, you know, a lot of the property, we've spoken about this, we've um, destocked cattle, we're getting right fire back onto country, um, but we've also got plans underway, and as many of you might be aware, we're looking to establish a feral predator-free area, um, an exclosure on the property. Uh, we know that these fences uh, will exclude cats, which are a key threat um, to many of our species, including the Northern Betong. So plans are, are currently underway to establish a 950 hectare exclosure. It's shown on the map there, the, the red dashed line is the approximate area. And so initially that was kind of um, uh, plotted, I guess, where historic Northern Betong records were. So you can see those little black triangles. Um, there's some of the historic records. 
since that time we've um we've gone in we've walked that fence line a few times and just refined it based on where we can physically establish a fence it's, we've got plenty of experience um, constructing these fences through central and southern australia um, what we haven't experienced yet is uh you know these these tall forests and creek crossings and and mountains in the north um, so yeah plans are progressing well and i should point out that we're working really closely with the northern beton recovery team um queensland parks there's traditional owners um to to you know make this project a reality google Baden are the traditional owners of country here at mount zero taravel so um you know they're really key to these plans as well uh, so um, just i guess as a, a bit of an update of where we're at with everything we've got the fence line kind of um, where we think it needs to go. Just last week we had engineers out on site looking at those creek crossings. Um, so obviously they're going to take a, a little bit of extra thinking. Um, in the next few weeks uh, we're anticipating having Google Barden out here to walk that fence line and just do a cultural heritage assessment um, and we will adjust uh, as needed there. Yeah. We're talking with uh, contractors, earthwork contractors, fence contractors and uh, fencing supplies um, to try and get uh, the ball rolling on all of these things. So although we've, you know, we've all been largely locked down by COVID this year, um, we've still got, uh, you know, some of these high priority projects that we are pushing forward with and making great progress. Mm, it's um, um, so, it's really yeah. exciting. This is, you know, it's always been a bit of a long term vision to get Northern Betons back at Mount Zero, um, and it's actually happening. So it's it's a great great thing. I think it's really exciting and, and just a couple of weeks ago being up at uh, Mount Lewis um, and you know working with the species up there uh, and yeah looking forward to the future of once again seeing no northern betongs back at Mount Zero Taravale and and you know the, the longer term plan I guess is seeing the population re-establish back across the Colin range um, beyond the fence um, and the success that we've had in the past too across AWC properties we know we can do this uh, so really exciting times. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we might come to some questions now. Flick, thanks so much for, for telling us all about this work. Here's a, a good one. Um, just asking how we manage feral cats more broadly on the property. So outside of the fenced area, are there efforts to reduce feral predator numbers? Yeah. So um, it's, you know, the, the general, I guess, consensus is that cat numbers up here and tend to be lower than what we see elsewhere um, but there is a lot of work going into monitoring and further understanding cats so we've had um, a researcher from um, JCU out here deploying a bunch of camera traps just to see what cats are doing throughout this landscape um, it is a bit hard to undertake any um, uh, you know control programs um, on the ground given the, the structure of the landscape uh, but certainly the number one tool that we have in our, our toolkit at the moment is these exposure fences to really um, eradicate cats from a, a set parcel of land um, until we can come up with that um, broader, I guess, method. Hmm. Yeah, and it's basically the same approach at properties across Northern Australia. Um, you know, operating on such a large scale, it's very difficult to get numbers down to you know, to a significantly lower level, but if we manage the landscape well, including through good fire management and destocking, we can reduce the impact of feral predators. That's broadly our approach across our, our large properties in northern Australia. Um, okay, some other questions here, Flick. Um, just asking about where the uh, the animals for the reintroduction will be sourced from. So I think you're saying that they'll be they'll be coming from multiple of the uh, remaining populations is that right yeah so that's the the plan and and that's a, a big reason behind the, the work that we're doing across these source populations now so those two extent populations at mount lewis um and the lamb range we are we're sending a, you know our teams of ecologists and, and volunteers um in uh doing the, the the monitoring work getting a really firm handle on how many individuals are there um we plan to to um, source up to 45 individuals across three different subpopulations uh, sub in the lamb range and up to 10 individuals from Mount Lewis but um, this is really driven by the the outcomes of the monitoring that we're doing um, over the next year or so. Mm, thanks. Um, 
a question here asking about the life cycle. Do you know what their um, reproductive cycle is like? How many young they can have at a time and that kind of thing? Yeah, so, um, well, they'll live for up to about seven years. Uh, a joey stays in the pouch for about 100 days, so roughly three months. And under good conditions, um, they can produce up to three young a year. So just one, one joey at a time in the pouch. Uh, but they're, they're not seasonal breeders. So um, assuming good conditions, they can just keep breeding. Hmm. Um, is there any collaboration with uh, universities or other research groups to look at genetics? And will that be part of the, the planning for the reintroduction? Certainly, that's already um, underway. So uh, Steph Todd, uh, another PhD candidate, she's already done a, a lot of genetic work um, across the, the remaining populations. And um, genetic structure is something that's really important um, for you know conserving um, these threatened species. So we'll, that's why we're wanting to take um, to source founder animals across uh, an, a number of different um, current populations to mix up those genetics and to create a really robust uh, found a population. Mm. Yeah, great. And that's um, that's critical for all of our projects, uh, tracking the genetic health of the populations and especially establishing new populations, making sure you've got that diversity um, initially. Um, great. Okay. Some more good questions here. We've got lots pouring in. Um, so one about uh, the tracking collars. So some of the animals will have tracking collars when they're released. What does that information tell you and how long do they last? Do they just fall off or do you have to catch the animal again and replace them? How does that work? So there's a, a number of, you know, a, a lot of different tech, tech options, I guess, that we've got at our disposal. Um, some animals will be fitted um, with a, a more basic collar that will just give us initial information on, um, you know, what they're doing, how they're going. A subset of endomatic a subset of individuals will have GPS collars attached. So that'll give us really fine, detailed information on movements and habitat use. Uh, so that will tell us, are they using you know, the, the, the wetter parts of the exposure fence that we've, we're establishing? Are they going out into the drier parts? What vegetation is really critical to them down here? Uh, and as part of, part of that work, uh, we'll be establishing a series of uh, telemetry towers on the property. Um, and so they will be logging data for us. But generally, you, you catch the animal, you fit a collar. Um, many of our collars, they will, they will log the information on them. So we then have to retrap the animal and download the data that way. Great. Um, now I've got just a couple more questions about the size of the fence. So um, I might just bring that map up again. So the fence is, well, the, the planned area for the fence encompasses a lot of that uh, wet sclerophyll forest. Um, can you just run over, run us over again the, um, the size and how that fence will be maintained as well in, in such a densely forested environment? Yep. Uh, so yeah, the, the current um, size of the, the proposed fenced area is 950 hectares and it doesn't incorporate, um, you know, a diversity of different habitat types uh, there. Um, so really critical to any of our fences is ongoing management. So the fence will be checked every couple of days, come rain, hail or shine, whether it's Christmas day or your birthday or, or whatever else. Um, and so that's a really big consideration for us. Also, um, as you mentioned, tall trees, creek crossings. So we're really having to put a lot of extra thought into um, the design of this fence, um, particularly around wet season. A, a pretty different landscape to the fence at Scotia, which is essentially yeah. in sand <laughs> in a completely flat landscape. Um, so yeah, planning is taking a little bit longer on, on this project. Um, Flick, a, a question here, which I think is really important, just about community involvement and community awareness of the project. Um, are other landholders getting involved or is there scope for that? Is there collaboration with other community, group, community groups on this work? So I guess um, a lot of the collaboration so far, as we mentioned, has been with um, so you know the Northern Betong Recovery Team, um, Parks. There's traditional owners is a key one there. Um, students as well. So there will be a lot of ongoing, uh, not only monitoring but research involved in this project. Um, across all of our properties, we have a lot of community engagement through our volunteering program. Uh, so 
I mean, yeah, I guess Sean answered that one definitely. Um, all engagement is really critical for us. Um, a, a couple of questions here about the the uh, anatomy of the betons. So, do they do they dig as much as burrowing betons? Do they have that same um, you know digging claws? And I've also got a, a photo of the tail here. So, yeah, do you want to just talk about what they're what they're designed to do? Certainly. Um, so, you know, they don't dig as much as something like the burrowing beton or the bilby, uh, which live in those underground burrow systems. The northern beton creates a little um, nest in amongst vegetation. Uh, they've got that, you know, curly whirly prehensile tail, just like the woily. Um, so, yeah, they, they build their own little nest above ground. Mm. Yeah, great. Um, and they actually use that well, the woilies at least use that to carry vegetation, don't they? So yeah, it's almost yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had a question earlier about how we prioritise which species to work on. And I think that's a really important one. We know that in Northern Australia, mammals are suffering declines right now. So, you know, over the last decade or a couple of decades, we've actually recorded declines from the top end right through Northern Australia. Um, so I guess one way is looking at which species are closest to the brink. And there was a, a really important paper a couple of years ago looking at the species most likely to go extinct. The northern beton came in at, I think, number 19 out of the top 20. Um, so, you know, within the next 20 years, there was a fair chance that it was a species likely to disappear. In this case, we've now got a fairly good understanding of its ecology, of what the threats are and how they operate. And we know that we've got, you know, we're equipped to intervene and do something about those threats and, and secure a population at Mount Zero. So, you know, that's that's one important way that we can stop this species going extinct. Um, yeah, prioritising otherwise, I guess AWC is trying to build the diversity of the species that we protect. So our mission, if you're not familiar, is effective conservation for all Australian animals and their habitats. Um, and to do that, we, we look at where we need to be working, but also which species require the most urgent interventions. Um, Northern Beton certainly qualifies on that front. Um, a question here, Flick, about the, the rest of the group, so the, the rest of the Beton family. Um, there are Betons in other parts of Australia, but as a family, they haven't fared very well, have they? Yes, I think there were six species identified as part of the Betonkia genus, two of those are now extinct, mm. and the remaining are, are threatened. Um, so yeah, certainly one of those you know, at-risk groups. Mm. Yeah, things like the, the burrowing beton, which you know estimates are that there were, would have been hundreds of millions of these animals across inland Australia. They're now completely extinct on the mainland outside of fenced uh, havens, like we've got at Scotia and, and Yukamar and places like that. So from you know this super abundant animal to something that's right on the brink of extinction. Um, there was also a southern beton or eastern beton, which is also extinct on the mainland, but hangs on in Tasmania. The woily, which you've talked about, a brush-tailed beton, also disappeared from most of its, um, its former distribution. So um, yeah, it's a, as a, a group, you know, they've certainly declined massively since European colonisation. Uh, but projects like this will ensure that we've got secure populations and hopefully we can see them gradually grow and repopulate as we understand how to deal with those threats on a, a larger scale. Uh, we talked a little bit about technology. Can you describe the telemetry towers that we're using for radio tracking of these animals? So we haven't come up with the final um, specs for them here. There'll be a little bit of trial to see uh, what our coverage in the area is like. Again, mountains and gullies isn't something that we've had to contend with too greatly elsewhere. Um, so there's been a, a few different options used elsewhere. I think in the Pilliga, they've got, um, is it like little telephone poles um, with the gear mounted on top? I think at Mallee Cliffs, there, um, they've got trailer mounted towers. Um, so it'll you know, either be one or a combination of some of these techniques. Uh, but the idea be, be, you know, behind the, the towers is that they'll be out there in the landscape and um, recording data for us when animals come within range. Uh, so we can download that data rather than having to go and track every single individual. It might just be that the, the towers haven't been able to pick up, um, you know, a small number that we then have to go out and hunt for on foot. So that'll save us, um, yeah, a, a lot of um, hours in the field. Um, technology, yeah, can do wonderful things for us. <laughs> yeah, between camera traps and those telemetry towers, 
um, you know, it's taking out a lot of manual labor that's required to get that data. So it's really come ahead in leaps and bounds. Um, okay, we've got one last question here about volunteering, and this is one that comes up a lot. Um, I'll just say to start with that we've got a volunteer portal. So if you go to our website um, and you'll find there a place where you can register on our volunteer portal, that's where we'll send out, we'll, we'll send you an email with any opportunity for volunteering on field work for projects like this, but also for general ecological surveys, biodiversity surveys. Um, it's a really great way of getting experience on the ground, uh, you know, coming up close and personal with some of these threatened animals, which you wouldn't otherwise be likely to see. So anyone who's interested in volunteering can go to our website and register on our volunteer portal. Anything to add, Fleet? Do you have volunteers working on this project at the moment? Yeah, so certainly that monitoring that I was talking about up um, in Mount Lewis and, and Lamb Range, um, you know, volunteers are a critical part of all this work that we're doing in the field. So if you're keen, please get in touch. I know that, you know, COVID and border restrictions are hampering things a little bit at the moment, um, but there'll be plenty of work to, you know, ahead with this particular project. So jump online um, onto the AWC website and you'll find all the details there. We look forward to having you out in the field. Flick. This is um, just the last beautiful photo of the Northern Betong from our photographer, Wayne Lawler, a stunning shot. Thank you so much for telling us all about this animal and about the project to establish a secure population at Mount Zero Tarabell. It's really interesting work. Um, thanks for taking the time to talk to us about it. No worries. Great chatting to you all. Yeah, and um, good luck to you and Maka. Um, it's, it's a fantastic property and I'm very jealous that you get to live there. <laughs> Come visit, Joey. <laughs> right, won't be long. Thank you to everyone who has tuned in today, and thank you especially for your support. Because all of this work is is not possible without you. If you're inspired by what we've been talking about and you'd like to make a donation, you can do that at our website. So it's AustralianWildlife.org, and click on the donate button. I also want to make sure that as many people as possible are hearing these webinars. So we've now got uh, recorded versions of 18 webinars up on the website. If you can think of anyone who would be interested in AWC's work, willing to support us, or who just wants to know more about Australian wildlife, please share that link with them or forward the email uh, about these webinars because we, we really want everyone to know about this work that we're doing. These are good news stories in a pretty difficult time. So I think, um, I think people will want to hear about them. Okay, that's all. We're actually taking a short break, uh, but we'll be back before the end of the year with a third season of AWC In Conversation, and I'll see you then. But